Live from London, this is BBC News. Some breaking news. Donald Trump's campaign team say he is safe following gunshots in his vicinity. A boat carrying migrants from France to Britain has sunk, killing at least eight people. Poland is set to declare a state of disaster as devastating floods continue to sweep through Central Europe, leaving seven dead and others missing. The Israeli military has denied claims by the Houthis in Yemen that a missile they fired at Israel was a hypersonic weapon. Hello, I'm Catherine Biarahanga. We begin with breaking news out of the US. Donald Trump's campaign team has released a statement just moments ago saying the former president is safe after gunshots were fired in his vicinity. No other details have been provided and it isn't clear how close the incident was to Mr. Trump. However, one US report has suggested that two people exchanged f gunfire outside his golf club in West Palm Beach, Florida. Security was tightened around the Republican presidential nominee after an, an assassination attempt at a campaign rally in July against him. That was in Pennsylvania. We'll bring you more on this as soon as we get it here on BBC News. Now, eight people have drowned while trying to cross the channel from France to England. The rubber boat was overloaded with more than 50 people on board, including Eritreans, Sudanese, Syrians and Iranians. It comes as Sakir Starmer heads off to Italy to meet his Italian counterpart, Georgia Maloney, tomorrow. The two leaders are expected to discuss illegal migration and to see what lessons can be learned from Italy's scheme of sending migrants to Albania. So far this year, 45 people have died trying to make the journey across the channel. That's the highest number since 2021 and nearly four times last year's figure. The boat got into difficulties off the French town of Omblatus and was driven onto the rocks where it came apart. The rocky shore made the French rescue effort difficult. Simon Jones has the latest. The channel has claimed more lives. This is what remains of the flimsy dinghy that took to the water in the early hours with the aim of getting to the UK. Most of those on board had no life jackets. Among the dead are people from Eritrea, Sudan, Syria, Afghanistan, Egypt and Iran. Le bilan est terrible. The toll is devastating as we mourn the loss of eight lives. The vessel departed from the Zlak sector near the town of Vimereux with 59 people on board. It quickly ran into trouble and appears to have crashed on the rocks directly in front of where we are now. Survivors were offered emergency treatment on the quayside near to the spot from which the boat had departed dangerously overloaded with its human cargo. So far this year, at least 45 people have died attempting the crossing. That's almost four times the number for the whole of last year. Many drowned, others were crushed. The government has reiterated its determination to smash the gangs organising the crossings. It's awful. It's a further loss of life. I sat with the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary, uh, the Attorney General and others at the National Crime Agency actually looking at the awful sort of um, rubber dinghies that people are coming across the channel with, discussing how we go after those gangs. But the Shadow Home Secretary says it was a big mistake for the government to scrap the Conservatives' plan to send some asylum seekers to Rwanda. We've seen fatalities uh, of illegal channel, channel crossings going up. We're seeing the numbers going up because the very first action of this Labour government was to scrap an international partnership which was deterring migrants. We know this because those migrants told us so. The recent deaths have not diminished the desire of many to get to the UK. Yesterday, more than a 1,000 people attempted the crossing. 800 were brought to Dover after being picked up in the channel. Bigger boats and bigger numbers mean there is real pressure on the government to stop the crossings and stop more loss of life at sea. Simon Jones, BBC News, Ombleteurs. 
Steve Smith is CEO of Care for Calais, the refugee charity. He told me about the impact the deaths may have on those trying to cross the channel to get to the UK. Well, it's truly shocking and tragic, but unfortunately, I'm not surprised um, because we're clearly seeing that deterrence doesn't work. The impact on the communities, the communities will be torn apart, as will some of our staff that are working with those communities in Calais. Uh, I'm sure there will be a vigil for those that died over the next 24 hours. Um, why do I say that deterrence isn't working? These are really desperate people. They're fleeing war, persecution, torture, trafficking, modern day slavery, you name it. The thought that uh, they may lose their lives in the channel isn't going to deter them because they seek safety somewhere and they understand that UK has a reputation for compassion, for kindness, for obeying international humanitarian law. That was Steve Smith from Care for Calais. Poland is said to declare a state of disaster as extreme flooding extends across parts of Central and Eastern Europe. The inundations have been triggered by Storm Boris, with torrential downpours forecast to continue until at least the end of Monday. At least five people have died in Romania, one person drowned in Poland, while in Austria, a firefighter died tackling the floods there. Several people remain unaccounted for in the Czech Republic. Some parts of Poland have faced the worst flooding in almost three decades, and a bridge collapsed in this historic Polish town near the Czech border. Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk earlier confirmed his government would declare a state of natural disaster. This gives the government greater control to counter and resolve the effects of the flooding. And these are some of the latest pictures we've had from the Czech army, showing their rescue operation in some of the worst hit parts of the country. They have been winching people to safety in helicopters in the northeastern of the Czech Republic around Jesenik. The mountainous spa town is totally cut off. Houses have been swept into a raging river. Our Eastern Europe correspondent Sarah Rainsford gave us, the up, gave us this update from the city of Nisa in southwest Poland. That's uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five uh, military trucks just rolling by as the uh, local mayor here in Nisa has ordered the evacuation of this town. Uh, because as you can see, uh, just look at the scene behind me, this is one of the main streets through the town of Nisa and it's completely flooded. The town hospital is just up there. We've seen pictures from inside it. We can't get anywhere near it, but inside the ground floor uh, is totally flooded. Uh, the emergency care patients are being evacuated. And the problem is that we're told that a dam has breached uh, some miles away from here, uh, but in such a position that the danger is that a wall of water is heading this way and that the water levels in this town could rise is heading this way and that the water levels in this town could rise even higher still. In fact, just up that way, uh, we've just been uh, looking at the, the river here. The water is extremely high, the level's very high, and it's moving extremely fast. So there's a bridge there under pressure too. And this is basically the scene right across this region here, the border region with the Czech Republic. We're close to the mountains. The water has been gushing down the mountainside and rivers here in southern Poland, as well as in the Czech Republic, have been and in Romania too, have been bursting their banks, uh, reservoirs overflowing. And obviously the consequences are extremely serious. So lots of people trapped in their homes, uh, lots of people having to be rescued across this region, uh, some of them by helicopter. We've seen dramatic pictures from the Czech Republic in particular, uh, people being winched to safety onto helicopters uh, from the roofs of their homes. Well, let's go live to Warsaw now and speak to Chief Commander of the Poland's State Fire Service, Mariusz Fotonowski, he is joining us from the National Rescue Coordination Centre. Thank you for joining us on the programme. First of all, just tell us, what is the situation in Poland at the moment? The, the situation is um, really serious. We have uh, affected four regions from 16 in, in our territory. So we activated the whole National Rescue and Firefighter System. As well, we are supported by military, border guard, uh, and uh, other services to deal with the situation. And we hear a lot of people comparing the situation to the floods in 1997. How does this situation compare to those historic floods? More or less, the situation started in the same area, like in 1997, and we are in close cooperation with our uh, colleagues from Czech Republic. 
and according to their estimation it will be really really, really similar so we uh, we expect uh, some difficulties during the next day we expect huge wave and I imagine that you must be incredibly busy at the moment. And we thank you for joining us on the program in the midst of what's going on. Just talk to us about the resources that have been deployed to assist people, including the mobilization of volunteers to help out. OK, so du during uh, uh, last day, we had almost 10,000 uh, intervention of firefighters units, uh, almost one and a half thousand a different kind of rescue vehicles uh, are in involved and uh, huge than 6,000 uh, responders from professional and voluntary fire service. Uh, so still we have reserve to mobilize. More or less from 10 other regions, we mobilize resources and the same from five from five uh, firefighter school. So the, the, the whole system is activated. We are as well in close cooperation with U European Union Civil Protection Mechanism. They supported us with uh, uh, with G, G uh, with satellite maps. Uh, now we are dealing with evacuation uh, the people using the helicopters. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mariusz Feltynowski, Chief Commander of the State Fire Service there in Poland. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us on BBC News. And a reminder that we have a live page running online with the latest on those catastrophic floods. You can find it on the BBC News app and on our website as well. To the Middle East now, and the Israeli military has rejected claims by the Houthis in Yemen that a missile they fired towards central Israel early on Sunday was a hypersonic weapon. The missile launch from Yemen fell in an open area after Israeli air defense systems failed to destroy it. There are no casualties. A spokesman for the Houthis said the operation involved what he called a new hypersonic missile, which traveled more than 2,000 kilometers in less than 12 minutes. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the Houthis will pay a heavy price for launching the attack. Our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams, has the latest on the attack from Jerusalem. This is an interesting attack. It, as you say, it didn't cause any damage, but it does not appear to have been intercepted by Israel's extremely sophisticated and multi-layered air defense system. In fact, the Israeli army in its statement said that there had been multiple efforts to shoot it down. It appears to have broken up and the damage caused on the ground seems to have been caused by uh, Israel's own interceptor missiles. The question is, how did uh, a, Yemen, a, a ballistic missile fired from Yemen reach Israel so far into Israel, the furthest any Yemeni ballistic missile has reached, uh, without being intercepted? Now, the Yemenis, uh, in a statement this morning, the Houthi uh, rebels say that they fired a new type of uh, uh, of uh, hypersonic uh, missile. Uh, they say that it traveled more than 2,000 kilometers in 11 and a half minutes. Now, there have been claims in the past that the Yemenis either had or were developing uh, such missiles. Uh, and clearly, uh, if such a thing has been proven today, then that is an additional challenge for the Israeli military as it figures out how to deal with this occasional threat. As for Mr. Netanyahu, well, he has, as you say, threatened uh, retaliation, and he has said, in his words, those who need a reminder in this matter are invited to visit the port of Hadeda. Now, that's a reference to Israel's extremely dramatic uh, air attack on the port of Hadeda back at the end of July, which caused a huge fire uh, in, oil, in an oil storage depot and was designed to be a major signal by the Israelis to the Houthis not to launch any further attacks against Israel. Now let's get a reminder of our breaking news this hour. Donald Trump's campaign team has released a statement saying the former president is safe after gunshots were fired in his vicinity. No other details have been provided and it isn't clear how close the incident was to Mr. Trump. However, one U.S. report has suggested that two people exchanged fire outside his golf club in West Palm Beach, Florida. 
Security was tightened around the, pres the Republican presidential nominee after an assassination attempt on him at a campaign rally in July in Pennsylvania. Just a reminder that you can always go to the BBC website for more on this. And just to add, there has been a post on the social media site X by the Secret Service, which confirmed that they were investigating a protective incident, they said, involving Trump that took place shortly before 2 p.m. Eastern time in the U.S. Then, of course, we'll have much more on that story as soon as we get it. And now it's time for a look at today's sports with Lizzie. Hi, Lizzie. Hello, Catherine. Thank you very much. We're starting with golf because the USA have won the Solheim Cup. They held off a final... And that's all the sport. Thank you, Lizzie. And we have an update on the breaking news this hour, which is that Donald Trump's campaign team has released a statement saying the former president is safe after gunshots were fired in his vicinity. There's now been a statement from the White House which says the president and vice president have been briefed about the security incident at the Trump International Golf Course where former President Trump was golfing. They are relieved to know that he is safe. They will be kept regularly updated by their team. And we also have an update from the Secret Service saying that they were investigating a protective incident involving Trump that took place shortly before 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the U.S. Of course, this comes following the assassination attempt against the former president back in July in Pennsylvania. We'll have much more on that story and we'll bring it to you here on BBC News. Now, Sakir Starmer is facing criticism for breaking parliamentary rules by failing to declare gifts of clothing to his wife from a Labour donor. The Prime Minister has now registered the items received by Lady Starmer, but he didn't do so on time. Tony Bonsignori has this update. According to the Sunday Times, Lord Ali covered the cost of a personal shopper and clothes for the PM's wife, Victoria Starmer, both before and after the general election. According to the rules, you're supposed to declare these things within 28 days, but that didn't happen. Downing Street say they thought they'd follow the rules, but after updated advice, had declared further items. Now, why does this matter? First, the source of these donations. Lord Allé is a huge donor to the Labour Party. He's also bought accommodation, clothes and glasses for the PM worth tens of thousands of pounds. And it follows allegations of cronyism after it emerged Lord Allé was given a temporary Downing Street security pass. Eyebrows have also been raised over whether the Prime Minister is right to take donations for things like this, particularly given his promise to clean up politics. The Foreign Secretary, David Lammy, has said that most Prime Ministers rely on donations for clothing, so they look their best when they represent the UK. But the Conservatives are calling for a full investigation into the links between Lord Ali and the Prime Minister. Now, it's one of television's big nights later with the Emmy Awards taking place in Los Angeles. Shows including hits like Baby Reindeer and The Crown are vying for recognition. Well, let's cross to Los Angeles and speak to film critic and reporter at KTL News, Jasmine Simpkins. So thank you for joining us on the programme. First of all, what are you looking forward to, to with tonight's ceremony? Well, we always love the fashion on the red carpet, right? Like we just, you get so excited and so jazzed to see everyone dressed in their Sunday's best and their Sunday's finest. So I'm always tuned in to the pre-telecast just to see the stars come and arrive looking so fabulous. Remember, this is our second Emmys this year. There was a January telecast after the strike. Um, uh, postponed it to that time period. So we're getting two Emmys in a year, but this one I think is just going to be a lot more over the top and a lot more fun. So looking forward to that. Then looking forward to the show and having the father and son duo of Dan and Eugene Levy uh, hosting. That's historic. And I think they're going to just start the show off with the great mood and be so funny because that's what we're all looking forward to, them to bring the comedy to the show. Yes, we can't forget the fashion, of course, at any awards ceremony and in terms of the highlights when it comes to tv shows shogun has the most nominations but there's also 
competition from other big shows like The Crown as well. Yes, yes. I've been joking and saying, bear with us. The show <laughs> must go on because I think it's going to be a big night for Shogun. As you said, they've got 25 nominations total. They won 14 at the Criti Creative Arts Emmys just last weekend. So, I mean, I think everyone's antennas are turned towards FX, if you know what I mean. I think it's going to be a big night for them having these two. I mean, I think it's going to be a big night for them having these two, you know, shows that everyone's been excited about, obviously The Bear and Shogun. But as you mentioned with The Crown, I do think that they are not going to go home empty handed. I think Elizabeth Debicki has a has a big chance in my, you know, she's been my um, prediction to win uh, uh, this evening. So I'm looking forward to seeing her get on that podium dressed fabulously as she always is and taking home a win for the crown. And Jasmine, very briefly, everybody will be watching out for Baby Reindeer. Of course, is caught up in some legal challenges. Will that affect whether it can win tonight? You know, I do think that Emmy voters are always keen to those kinds of situations, especially when you have some controversy so close to a telecast, but they cast their votes, you know, weeks ago. Um, so I think that tonight it could be one of those shockers, right, where they still take home a win. It was one of those shows that everyone's been talking about. So I don't know necessarily that they'll be snubbed totally, um, but I think that everyone's going to be holding their breath <laughs> so during that particular... To, to watch yeah. out for. Jasmine yeah. Simpkins, thank you for so much for joining us on BBC News. Thank you for having me. And a reminder of the breaking news this hour, which is that Donald Trump's campaign team has released a statement saying the former president is safe after gunshots were fired in his vicinity. The team did not provide any other details about the incident. Of course, this comes following the assassination attempt on the president, former president, at a campaign rally back in July. The White House has released a statement saying the president and vice president are being briefed on the situation. We'll have much more on that here on BBC News. Hello. Sunday's really brought us a mixture of weather. In the south, we've had some sunshine. Temperatures reached 20 degrees, quite pleasant for the time of year. Across Northern Ireland, the weather brightened up through the afternoon, but we also had a couple of bands of rain across the UK, one across England and Wales, and a heavier pulse of rain that worked its way into Scotland as well. With this uh, weather front as it pushed into Lancashire, things turned rather murky for a time, certainly a lot of low cloud associated with that front. The front in Scotland clears away very quickly overnight, but the one in England and Wales just sinks southwards, where it could still be bringing an odd patch of damp weather, an odd bit of drizzle through the night. Quite mild underneath that strip of cloud, but for most of the UK, it's quite a chilly night with temperatures dropping well down into single figures. Now, uh, we've still got uh, trouble ahead with Storm Boris continuing to bring torrential rain into Central Europe. It's going to be days before these floods ebb away. For the UK, we get this area of high pressure building through Monday, and that's going to be around for most of the week ahead, bringing some fine weather. The main hazard for us is that we could see some mist and fog patches. And I think Monday morning, we're probably going to start off with mist and fog across the north and west of the UK with some poor visibility here. Fog won't last very long. The September sun is still pretty strong. And so through the day, most areas will brighten up with plenty of sunshine to look forward to. And the temperature is running quite close to average, really, at this time of the year. Average in Edinburgh is 17. Average in London is 20. So 21 is a squeak above. Heading into Tuesday, the area of high pressure is going to reorientate a little bit, sending some slightly milder air northwards. A weak weather front, meanwhile, could bring a zone of cloudy weather with a few patches of rain across the Northern Isles. But otherwise, it's another fine and dry day with mist and fog patches clearing, sunny spells to look forward to and rising temperatures. We're up to 21 degrees in Glasgow, a 21 for London as well. By Wednesday, again, if you do see some mist and fog patches, they're most likely across the north and west of the UK. Probably a bit too much in the way of breeze for that across East Anglia and South East England. Continuing to get a little bit warmer with top temperatures up to 22 in northern areas of Scotland, a 20 for western counties of Northern Ireland, but up to 24 towards parts of South East England, which is warm for the time of year. And we're going to hang on to this dry and relatively sunny weather really through most of the rest of this week. Bye for now.
Ukraine is just about holding the front here while the Russians have launched this fresh assault. Everywhere you look, there are uprooted trees, there are bits of building, and the destruction is just in every direction. Incendiary drones were dropped here. We know this was the military hunter because the rebels don't have that kind of weaponry. When you can hear the tear gas canisters being lobbed at the protesters. There, when the story breaks. BBC News. Follow on the app. Today we're looking at the state of British politics. Asking is technology ruining football? Are we too obsessed with our phones? Helen from Hull wants to know, how hot's the planet going to get? And we'll explain why prices keep going up and up. Also, Rach, did you know, space has its own smell. Really? What of? The world is fast moving and can be confusing. So let's talk about it. Five Live Breakfast with Rachel and Rick. Listen on BBC Sounds. Discovering the world's table, we travel the globe, unearthing the history behind our most celebrated dishes. This is like a work of art. Meeting the people preserving local ingredients and those adapting traditions for modern tastes. They call people from here potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> Potato yeah. people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Each recipe tells its own unique story, bringing a fresh perspective on our changing world. Join me, Nick Quick, for discovering the world's table. Watch on iPlayer.